Um, welcome everybody to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Marina Picciotto, is currently uh, a Charles Murphy professor in psychiatry and professor of neurobiology and pharmacology at U Yale University. She is also uh, serves as assistant chair for the basic science research for the Department of Psychiatry and as an associate director of the MD-PhD program uh, for Yale, um, Yale University School of Medicine. She is a um, senior editor of the Journal of Neuroscience and serves also as scientific counselor uh, for the Society for Neuroscience and NIDA, so she knows very well the innings of um, NIH. Dr. Picciotto uh, received her PhD, her first her bachelor's from Stanford University, and then her PhD from Rockefeller University, where she worked in the laboratory of Dr. Paul Greengard. She went on to conduct uh, postdoctoral research at uh, the Pasteur Institute in France, in Paris, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre um, Jean Chanchet, uh, before uh, joining the faculty at Yale University in 1995. Dr. Picciotto's research is on animal models of psychiatry illness, uh, with a particular emphasis on the role of nicotine acetylcholine receptors in behaviors related to addiction, depression, learning, and appetite. Uh, she's going to tell us um, about some beautiful work, and very important work, that uh, she recently published in Science, and possibly something else, but uh, I wanted to specifically mention this work in which she um, uncovered a potential mechanism for nicotine um, acting on hypothalamic pulsing neurons and decreasing appetite, and um, if you're lucky enough, you are even able to hear about that on uh, NPR, which is what happened to me one evening going back home um, last year and learn a lot about her work. So it's really um, a pleasure to have you here and tell us more about that. So thank you very much for the uh, invitation for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I will be talking today a lot about uh, nicotine addiction. And I, uh, I did my degree uh, as, a, as a graduate student on the phosphorylation of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. So I got my degree in molecular neuroscience working on a protein that isn't even expressed in neurons. However, it was very hard to talk about it on the train, on the Amtrak train. And now, when people ask me what I do, I say, I work on what nicotine does to the brain. And frankly, everybody has a story. So everybody knows what nicotine does to the brain, whether they are a current or former smoker, or the relative of, of a smoker, or someone who's even seen smokers on TV. Um, everybody knows that nicotine is a psychoactive substance that is addictive, and that has many other effects on behavior. And uh, of course, it's a huge public health problem. It's still the major preventable cause of mortality in the United States. More than 300,000 people die every year as a consequence of nicotine addiction. So understanding the basic neuroscience of this uh, one substance could make an enormous difference for human health. And from the standpoint of uh, basic neuroscience, we didn't evolve nicotinic acetylcholine receptors just so we could roll up a plant leaf, stick it in our mouths, and set it on fire. Obviously, these receptors are in the brain for a reason. And so one of the real major goals of the research, in addition to understanding nicotine addiction and the behaviors related to nicotine addiction, is to understand what these molecules do to the function of a normal brain, the function of a normal nerve cell. So I'll try to take you through some of our work today. And hopefully, you'll see how we try to make links between uh, the basic molecular biology or the molecular um, um, uh, the molecular description of these receptors through the level of what they do to cells, to circuits, and then to behaviors. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about. So here's the problem. We know quite a lot about the molecular biology of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There's a giant family. Well, it's not so giant. But you can see there are about um, 15 uh, subunits. And these combine together to cause an enormous diversity of nicotine receptors 
uh, in the brain. And nicotine receptors is a shorthand. They're named for the pharmacological substance, nicotine, that activates them, but they actually transduce uh, a normal uh, neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We also know a lot about the brain areas in which these are expressed. So uh, this is actually uh, an MRI of a human brain, and this is a SPECT study done by Julie Staley and her colleagues with a radio-labeled nicotine-like molecule that shows that these are expressed throughout the brain and, in fact, in almost every nerve cell. And we know a lot about the behavioral consequences of uh, nicotine's effects in the brain because we've been doing this bioassay on ourselves as a, as a population for thousands of years. We know that people report that they smoke for, for many, many different reasons, and we can get clues about the effects of uh, nicotine and nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on circuits and behavior uh, from what people report when they uh, choose to smoke and when they have trouble quitting. So our problem is to link this large biochemistry and molecular biology knowledge base with this neuroanatomical database and this behavioral database. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit about each of these levels and what we know, and then we'll try to put them together. So this is the molecule. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are sitting in the membrane of nerve cells and actually of many other cells in the body as well, but I'll be talking really about the brain today. And they are ion channels with a pore that opens when a ligand, in this case I'm diagramming acetylcholine, binds uh, at the interface between two subunits. So subunits are simply uh, the staves of a barrel around which uh, they, they surround a pore that allows ions to flow across a membrane. And this type here, which we know the most about, is the type that is at the neuromuscular junction. So all communication between nerve and muscle goes through this type. We know about its structure, we know about its, its uh, biophysics, about its pharmacology. And these are the main types that are expressed in neurons and in the brain. And of course, there's one type here you can see at the top that has five components, five subunits that are all the same. And so it has slightly different properties from these two heteromeric. This is the homomeric. Heteromeric subtypes have at least one kind of alpha and at least one kind of beta in order to be functional. And sometimes it can be really variable and have up to four or five different subunits. And so each of these subtypes has different properties. When the ligand binds at the interface, you can imagine that if you have four different interfaces, you could have four different properties of that binding, how tightly it binds, the affinity, um, how likely the receptor is to open, so the open probability, and then how likely the, um, the, the, trans the uh, receptor is to be refractory to opening again once this binds, the desensitization kinetics. And that variability gives rise to the very different properties of nicotine at different cell types and at different receptors. So in the brain, uh, we have a great deal of information about how these different subunits are expressed. So here's just a panel of in situ hybridization at two different levels through the mouse brain, showing you that if you just take nine of those different subunits, you can see that there's uh, several different types of patterns of expression. So I'll go through this more in detail in a later slide. Uh, but what you can see here is that there are types that are very widely expressed. So these two are actually partners. And types that are very specifically expressed in particular brain areas. And so they have obviously different co uh, consequences when you activate them. And the other point that I want to make is that the pattern of uh, receptor expression, although it differs somewhat between mouse and human, is really pretty highly conserved. So here you're looking at a human scan with a section like this right through the brain. And this is the thalamus. This is the uh, relay station for inform sensory information from the periphery up to the cortex for action. And this is the mouse brain, and it's cut like this. But what you can see is in both cases, here's the thalamus, here's the thalamus. This is a hot spot for expression of receptors. I'm not going to talk about that brain area today, but it's just an example of how there is conservation of the overall pattern of expression between um, mouse and human. So now I'm going to go through some of the different reasons people report that they smoke. Now, clearly, one thing that is known, despite the fact that uh, tobacco ex company executives can still get up and say, oh, it's not addictive, it's a choice, it's a habit. Nicotine in tobacco is clearly addictive. It drives ongoing smoking. If you take nicotine out of tobacco and you allow people to continue to smoke, they'll actually extinguish their smoking. They'll smoke less over time. So the nicotine that is in tobacco is reinforcing, like other drugs of abuse, like cocaine, amphetamine. Um, it acts on similar parts of the brain. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And it's important for ongoing smoking. 
So the part of the brain that is really implicated most strongly in the addictive properties of all drugs of abuse that are used, abused by humans today is still the mesolimbic dopamine system. It's not the only part of the brain where these um, substances act, but it is a convergent part of the brain where we know quite a bit about uh, the, uh, the transition of liking something to using it habitually. And what you can see here, again, now this is a blow up of the panel of in situ hybridization for the RNA of nine different subunits, is that nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are expressed quite highly and quite selectively in the cell bodies of these dopamine neurons. So I'll just diagram it here. This mustache here is the, um, it represents the uh, ventral tegmental area, the cell bodies uh, that are important for addiction-related behaviors. And this tail here is the substantia nigra. These are the dopamine cell bodies that degenerate in Parkinson's disease and result in the uh, inability to perform voluntary movement. And what you can see is there's some subtypes that are really highly selectively expressed here in these dopamine neurons. And alpha-6 and beta-3 are expressed here. They're also expressed in noradrenergic neurons, so it's not only dopamine neurons, but there's something special about these subunits in neurons that um, express catecholamines like dopamine and norepinephrine. And then these subtypes here, beta-2 and alpha-4 that I mentioned are very widespread, still have that mustache right here, even though they're uh, expressed in many, many different neuronal subtypes, almost all of them, not all of them. You can see that they're also selectively expressed here in the dopamine cell bodies. And then there's an accessory subunit here, alpha-5. This is very important because there's a human polymorphism in alpha-5 that's probably one of the, the genes of greatest effect on both smoking behavior as well as other behaviors, including alcoholism. That's expressed quite highly in this brain area. And even though you can't see very much here, there's even some of this homomeric type alpha-7. So what you can see is that there are a lot of different subtypes that can control these dopamine neurons. And when we look at a very simplified brain, this is my quite um, uh, scaled up brain. I used to have a one neuron brain. Now I have a one, two, three, four, four neuron, five neuron brain. Uh, what you can see is that nicotinic receptors are very good at modulating this circuit. So there are nicotine receptors on the cell bodies of these dopamine neurons. Those are very easy to understand. When either nicotine or acetylcholine binds to these receptors, these neurons fire, you increase their activity, and you can increase the, um, the dopamine release from the other side. But that's not all, because if you cut off the terminals of these neurons and you simply put them in the test tube in a preparation called the synaptosome, and you put nicotine on those terminals, nicotinic receptors are on those terminals and on their own are enough to cause dopamine release. And if that weren't enough, there are also nicotinic receptors on the neurons that drive the firing or inhibit the firing of these cell bodies. So it's not, uncomplica not, not uncomplicated, like many things to do with nicotine. Nicotine can do some things and it's opposite, and I'll explain why this is interesting in a minute. So glutamate, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, drives the firing of these dopamine neurons. There are nicotine receptors on their terminals, and nicotine can stimulate the drive on this circuit. At the same time, at baseline, GABA neurons, which are the primary inhibitory neurons in this circuit, or in the brain, have nicotine receptors on their terminals. And so at baseline, you have a mixed excitation and inhibition of these dopamine neurons. And one laboratory, uh, actually a few laboratories now, but particularly the laboratory of Dan McGee at the University of Chicago showed very nicely that although this happens at baseline, if you leave nicotine on a slice for about a half hour to an hour, these receptors keep driving excitation onto these dopamine cell bodies, whereas the nicotine receptors on these neurons actually desensitize more rapidly. So you go from a mixed excitation and inhibition to a more unmixed excitatory drive on this circuit which can actually uh, continue to get this circuit activated for a longer period of time than you might think from receptors that actually desensitize. So all of this to say that nicotine is very good at getting dopamine neurons to fire and to get dopamine released. So what we did when we started out was to actually ask the question of that large group of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which ones are really essential for these properties of uh, nicotine to drive the dopamine circuit? And the first one that we picked was this uh, beta-2 subunit because it was really extremely widespread. And I showed you it was a partner with alpha-4. We didn't know that at the time, but it turns out to be true. And so when we knocked out the, this um, subunit in mice, we were pleasantly surprised to find out that all of the high affinity, the tightest binding sites for nicotine were gone in the mouse brain. So it turned out that we actually were uh, 
lucky in that we chose the receptor that was most likely to, to transduce the signal from the small amounts of nicotine that get into the brain from cigarette smoking. And what we saw was that without that one subunit, normally nicotine could cause these, do this, so this is a, a, a slice through the dopamine cell body region, a patch clamp experiment where we actually measure the firing of individual dopamine neurons. And what you can see is that nicotine normally excites these neurons and each of these lines is an action potential. When nicotine's on, you get more action potentials, these neurons fire. And if you knock out the beta-2 subunit, that goes away. So you need the beta-2 subunit out of all those 15. It's enough to take away one of those subunits to get rid of the ability of nicotine to cause these dopamine neurons to fire. And of course, as I told you, nicotine's good at stimulating this whole circuit. So we did an experiment where we looked at peripherally administered nicotine, so bathe the whole brain in nicotine and body. And what you can see is that if you put a probe into the terminal fields of those dopamine neurons, you measure how much dopamine is, is released as a result of stimulating every neuron in the brain, what you can see is that normally nicotine has a dose-dependent ability to stimulate dopamine release, and that's completely gone. Despite the um, many areas where nicotinic receptors can activate the circuit, that's gone completely if you take away this one subunit. And we can even look at the terminals in a, in a um, synapsome preparation. What you can see is that uh, that's also completely gone with this one subunit knockout. So this was the first step in trying to connect this body of molecular biology, this family of nicotinic receptors, with a physiological function, but more important, with a behavioral function. So I told you that some of the hallmarks of drugs of abuse is that they are psychostimulants, not all of them, but many of them. And when you increase dopamine, often in a mouse, what you also do is you increase movement. You increase excitation. You can imagine that, for example, cocaine and amphetamine are arousing. People smoke because they say that they want to be awake, they want to be uh, engaged. And we can use a proxy of that in the mouse where we look at simply movement in a, in, a, in a familiar environment. And in this case, what we see is that normally if we ask, if we administer nicotine to a normal mouse, they move more than a mouse that's just getting a vehicle. So in this case, it's a saccharin solution. And if we knock out this one subunit, that actually is completely abolished. So this is like a stimulant, this arousing component, which we think is associated, and actually we've shown pharmacologically is associated with the dopamine system, goes away with this one knockout. And then we can measure whether or not the mouse uh, finds the nicotine rewarding by giving it um, a choice between exploring in an environment that's been paired with the saline solution or an environment that's been paired with nicotine. So it's as if every time you came into this auditorium, I uh, let you smoke and drink, and every time you went into the room next door, you were uh, asked to listen to me speak, and then after that I gave you a choice which auditorium you wanted to be in, you would potentially come to the auditorium where you were hearing me speak because I'm very rewarding. So we do this with nicotine in a mouse, and what you can see is that after training, the mice explore more. They spend more time in the environment paired with nicotine than they do in the environment paired with saline, and if you knock out the beta-2 subunit, that goes away completely. And we interpret this as saying they can't learn to pair an environment with the rewarding um, experience that they have with nicotine. And finally, the gold standard for um, drugs of abuse is whether an animal will really work to get that drug of abuse. And the paradigm that's been used, and um, some of the people in this room are using it um, to good effect, is called self-administration. So will an animal do some function, in this case it's poking its nose into a hole, in order to get infusions of the drug into, almost directly into the brain, because it goes into the um, jugular and it goes directly to the brain. And what you can see here is that mice that are uh, wild-type mice, we train them to self-administer cocaine, and then we switch them from cocaine to nicotine, and those normal mice will keep poking their nose for nicotine. If we take the normal mice and we switch them to saline, they will actually extinguish. They'll stop bothering to poke their nose. It's not worth it. They're not getting anything. That's extinction. And if we take these knockout mice and we switch them from cocaine to nicotine, they just look like they got a, a saline solution. So what we've done now is we've got a, a battery of behaviors. And whenever we do behavior in a mouse, you, there's a lot of reasons that a mouse can change its behavior. But if you take a number of different behaviors that are associated with the properties that are important in humans, I think we can come closer to modeling uh, a human behavioral disease. And in this case, we have um, all of the components that we've looked at that are associated with addiction in humans are altered when we take away this one component of the nicotinic receptor. So this was the start of this uh, uh, research, and now a number of um, different groups have begun to ask much more specific questions. This is a constitutive knockout 
These genes, this gene is gone from the first moment of development throughout the lifespan of the animal. It's gone in every cell. Um, we have correlations here, but we don't have causation. And so there have been a number of experiments that have been done over the last probably 10 years in order to get more uh, specifically at which cells and which um, times do we need these uh, receptors. So one experiment that I will tell you about right now, because we did it in our lab, uh, involved a uh, transgenic system in which we were able to rescue the beta-2 subunit expression selectively in particular cell types, and to do that under the control of an inducible promoter, so we could get both cell type and temporal specificity. And I'm just going to show you one behavior here. And this system may be one that's familiar to all of you, particularly Jing Shen Shen, who's in the audience and who uh, developed the, the first uh, mice of this kind that we used. And these uh, uh, mice are, are bi-transgenic. They have a uh, general neuron-specific promoter that's quite minimal that drives a synthetic transcription factor, the TET transactivator. And that transactivator then binds to a promoter that's uh, uh, driven by the, only by this uh, synthetic transcription factor in, in the mouse brain, because there's nothing else to drive it. And it drives, in this case, the beta-2 subunit. And when tetracycline or its analog, doxycycline, binds to that transcription factor, it can't uh, cause transcription of the beta-2 subunit. And then a lot of breeding happens. Uh, luckily, we don't have to do it. The mice do. but. The time it takes to make these triple transgenic mice is considerable, and Sarah King, who was the postdoc who did this, was heroic. And what she did was to cross these two transgenes onto the homozygous beta-2 knockout background and rescue uh, the beta-2 subunit expression so that all of the beta-2 subunit expression in the brain came only from this inducible transgene. And we did this with a number of mice that uh, Jim Jing Shen and Max Kells uh, developed, as well as a line that we got from Mark Mayford. And we got many different patterns of expression. So here is, I'm showing you radio-labeled nicotine binding in the brain. You can see that pattern. That's the normal wild-type pattern. And here's the knockout. All goes away. Really, we can expose this as long as we want. And it just, there's no, no binding there. And then there are here four different lines. And in this line, we found that we were rescuing the, um, the lama cort actually the corticothalamic neurons. I won't talk to you about those today, but those are extremely important for understanding what nicotine does to the connection between neurons in the circuit during development. And we've been uh, actively using those uh, mice for that experiment. One turned out to be expressing predominantly in visual nuclei in the retina and the projection neurons um, in, in the brain. And uh, Mike Crayer's lab at Yale has used that to examine the development of retinal waves during uh, visual system development. This um, one turned out to be the highest expressing, and also we never used it because the mice looked um, uh, sort of strange. They circled. And since we didn't want to do something uh, non-selective, we haven't studied these further. But this line here, there's that mustache. We um, were able to rescue expression selectively in these uh, VTA neurons and in their projections uh, here in the uh, nucleus cummins, in the, uh, some in the striatum, but more in the nucleus cummins. And so we used that line to ask if we only now have beta-2 subunit expression in these VTA neurons, can we rescue any of those behaviors? And it turns out, yes. So here's, um, I'm showing you again the locomotor activity data, where nicotine is, acts as a psychostimulant and increases activity. The knockout doesn't show that activity. And when we rescue only in the VTA, that's enough to rescue this dopamine-dependent behavior. So now we're um, on the way to connecting a brain region to the effects of a particular subunit in these behaviors. And now a whole field has actually converged to, um, to do uh, really careful work to identify what are the different subunits and what are the brain areas that are involved. And some really elegant work uh, was done by Uwe Mascos and his colleagues in Jean-Pierre Changer's lab, where they used a lentiviral expression to re-express uh, the beta-2 subunit first um, in the um, VTA as a whole. And they showed that that could rescue nicotine self-administration. So that's a very important behavior related to addiction. And then um, Henry Lester's group at Caltech did a series of beautiful rescue experiments, actually not rescue experiments, knock-in experiments, where they put point mutations into either uh, a, the partner of beta-2, which is alpha-4, or that one of those subunits that's really selective for dopamine neurons, alpha-6. And if they made those uh, receptors really hypersensitive to nicotine, now they could show behaviors like place preference at doses of nicotine that were so low they were completely ignored by a normal mouse. So here's, uh, first we had necessary, now it's sufficient 
uh, to drive these, uh, the reward um, for nicotine. And together, what this showed was, oh, and I actually didn't show it here, and I should have, I'm sorry, but T.K. Booker and Steve Heinemann's lab showed just last year that if they made a selective knockout of the alpha-4 subunit only in dopamine neurons, that was also sufficient to abolish uh, nicotine place preference. So together as a field, we've come up with a consensus, which is that these alpha-4, alpha-6, beta-2 nicotinic receptors in dopamine neurons of the VTA are both necessary and sufficient for a whole panel of behaviors that are related to nicotine reward, nicotine reinforcement, the hallmark behaviors with, with addiction. So that's now started uh, to fill in some of the blanks of our diagram here. We know that we have an, a nicotinic receptor subtype. Out of all of these, we know this one is the essential one for the addictive properties of nicotine. And we also have a brain area. So it's these dopamine neurons particularly that are essential for these behaviors. And now looking back, it all seems very logical and not very surprising. But of course, when we started this, um, it was not at all clear that with this extremely broad expression pattern of nicotinic receptor receptor subunits and the large number of subunits that we could actually be quite um, pointed and figure out which receptors in which brain areas were essential. So that's where we're starting. And that, all of that is long since published and is background for the next part of this talk. And that is, what's another reason that people say they smoke? And I find this particularly tragic because when you go out and you ask people why they smoke, some people say, well, um, I want to, uh, I, you know, I, I like it. I don't want to stop. And that's generally a hallmark of reinforcement of, of addiction. But the group that s reports that they smoke um, to control their appetite is largely teenage girls. So one of the primary reasons that teenage girls say they start smoking, not even that they're continuing to smoke, is in order to control body weight. In addition, a lot of people say, you ask people, why don't you quit? And they say, well, I'm afraid to gain weight. Now, on average, across the population, we know that smokers are actually leaner from epidemiological studies than non-smokers, but it's not a lot. It's about 2.5 kilograms. It's a little more than five pounds. And yet, of course, some people gain a lot more. Some obviously have to gain less for this to be on average 2.5 kilograms. And yet it is a, a barrier to having people stop smoking. And so uh, we wanted to ask, uh, what's the link, what is the link between smoking and body weight? So as I mentioned, on average, smokers are leaner and that quitting leads to, um, I actually just said all of this, leads to weight gain, and it's reported to be a, a, a major reason that some people start smoking. And there had been a, a, a pretty good um, uh, behavioral literature, and particularly this is come, work from Neil Grunberg's lab, who's here at USIS just across the street, who had shown that it's probably the nicotine and tobacco that's important for um, appetite changes. And how he'd shown that is to use um, rat models and shown that nicotine itself, of all of the 4,000 constituents in tobacco, is enough to decrease food intake in rats. He also showed very nicely that there's a sex difference so that female rats are more sensitive to this effect than male rats. Um, and there's also been a literature around um, the effects of withdrawal on uh, both metabolic and brain systems that are associated with food intake. And in this case, um, Michele Zoli showed that after um, nicotine withdrawal, if you treat chronically in rats, uh, that there is this increase in body weight, but there's also increases in expression of uh, molecules in both brown and white adipose tissue and in the brain that are associated with um, metabolic regulation. So it's probably a complex process. And so the question that we're um, really asking here is what are the neurobiological mechanisms that underlie these observations that have been around for quite a while? So first we had to see if we could reproduce these behavioral studies um, in mice. And so what we did was to just treat um, every day with one injection uh, normal C57 black 6 mice with increasing doses of nicotine. So what you can see is that even at the lowest uh, dose, which is about 100 micrograms per kilogram, we see a decrease in the weight gain over time of uh, these mice when we treat daily with nicotine. And what you can see is two things. One is that um, there isn't desensitization of this effect. It doesn't go away. This is continuous. And that's also what you see in smokers. Smokers maintain whatever uh, weight decrease they have until they quit smoking. And then in turn, they probably go back up to where they would have been. The other thing that I think is important, but it is completely not uh, relevant to our talk today, is that mice continue to weight, gain weight over time just like we humans do as, as we age. 
It's just a, a little fun fact for you. And as we increase the dose of nicotine, so here's 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, the animals actually lose weight before they go back to a trajectory of gaining weight, but at a slower rate at, uh, as other mice, uh, control mice. At this very high uh, dose of nicotine, I'm not sure that that's selective, but these, I am convinced, are, are uh, selective effects of nicotine on, on food intake. And then we started to use um, more selective pharmacological agents to see if we could ask questions about what subtypes of nicotinic receptors might be involved. And we were lucky in that we had a, um, a plant alkaloid, in this case cytosine, which is from the laburnum leaf, that in mice is a partial agonist of nicotinic receptors. So it opens them, but not nearly as much as uh, nicotine does. So here's our, um, our normal uh, addiction-related receptor, the alpha-4, beta-2 receptors I just spent time talking to you about. What you can see is nicotine causes an inward current through these receptors. But cytosine, through these receptors, is a low efficacy partial agonist. It opens them, but not very much. When, what that means is that if acetylcholine, the normal ligand, comes in here and cytosine is around, it's actually going to block the effects of acetylcholine because it's already, already there, opening a little bit, but um, uh, not fully. And in mice, this uh, ligand, cytosine, is also a full agonist of another receptor that's in the autonomic ganglia, alpha-3, beta-4. And that's, it's, it's expressed in the brain, but in very localized areas and to a much lesser extent the other um, subtypes. And I will tell you this again at the end, but unfortunately, these properties are specific for mouse receptors. If you look at cytosine on alpha-3, beta-4 receptors from human and oocytes, it looks much more like this. So it's not a full agonist of these receptors in human, which is a cautionary tale that really, when you're doing drug development, you really need to do selective expression of the human subtype and not the mouse subtype. So we did use these in mice to see whether cytosine uh, had the same effects of nicotine. And what you can see here is that cytosine had exactly the same effects on body weight gain in mice uh, than uh, as nicotine. So that suggests that whatever's happening here, uh, it's a property shared by cytosine and nicotine and makes it a little more likely that it's probably acting at this receptor, but that was just a hint. We also wanted to know whether this was really an effect on body fat percentage or whether it was a selective effect. Maybe they just don't drink as much. So we had to really make sure that these were leaner mice. And one way that we did this was to um, collaborate with our colleague, Tomas Horvath, who's at Yale, and to do a little MRI of these uh, mice. And we were able to measure total body fat content. And what you can see is that both cytosine and nicotine actually decrease the fat content of mice. It's not just that they decrease food intake, they also are actually leaner after these treatments. So here we have um, our receptors again. We had a hint from pharmacology that this subtype might be important, um, but was really just a start. And then um, because this subtype was known as the ganglionic receptor, it increases sympathetic function, we thought, well, maybe this could actually be working in the peripheral nervous system just to activate the mice. And that's why they're leaner. So we had to start by asking, does this happen in the brain or does it happen in the periphery? So what we used was a selective antagonist that can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So anything in the body would be blocked. And what you can see is that that antagonist on its own had no effect, and it didn't block the ability of cytosine to decrease food intake either. So this gave us the clue that this is actually happening in the brain and not in the body. So where is this happening? Well, there's been an entire explosion of uh, neuroanatomical and physiological studies that have implicated the ventral hypothalamus, um, the part of the brain that regulates metabolism, that me regulates a lot of communication between the brain and the body as a, a critical center for uh, matching your need for calories with your behavior. And so we thought, this is probably a good place to look. Um, uh, Lorna Roll and her colleagues had already started to do sort of some ex investigation of the ability of nicotine to cause firing of different cell types in the hypothalamus as a whole. And there are, in particular, two groups of neurons in the ventral hypothalamus, and this is the arcuate nucleus. One that is um, uh, visualized by a uh, peptide called proopiomelanocortin, or POMC, and when these cells fire, it signals satiety. It signals, I've got enough calories. I can actually now do something much more interesting than forage for food. Perhaps I can go and listen to a lecture by Marina Pachotto. And in this population of neurons that are characterized by expression of the neuropeptide NPY, this signals, I do not have enough calories. Please feed me now. So if you stimulate these neurons, you stop eating. 
if you stimulate these neurons, you actually go out and forage for food. And actually, some recent um, experiments with optogenetics, where you can use light to make a particular neuronal types fire, you can show that just using light, you can uh, cause these cells to fire, cause decreases in feeding, cause these cells, cells to fire, and cause increases in feeding. So since nicotinic receptors are generally excitatory, we thought, well, maybe it's nicotinic receptors on these cells that are important for the ability of nicotine to decrease appetite. And when I say we, I mean Jan Miner, who was the um, uh, postdoc and now associate research scientist who did these studies. So what we did was we sectioned through the ventral hypothalamus, here's the arcuate nucleus, and we did double staining for uh, a marker of neuronal fire firing, which is CFOS, and for the pro-opiomelanocortin peptide, and we asked, is there a co-localization of CFOS staining and POMC? And what we saw was quite interesting, and that is when we looked for overall firing of cells in the, the, the arcuate nucleus as a whole, we didn't actually see any difference after either cytosine or nicotine, or after the blocker of uh, nicotinic receptors, mecamelamine. And that's interesting because here we have the POMC neurons and the um, NPY neurons, so maybe we're averaging across those. But when we selectively looked at cells that were double stained for CFOS, activity marker, and POMC, satiety marker, what you can see is both cytosine and nicotine could increase CFOS expression in POMC neurons. This was true acutely, and just like the behavior, which lasted over time, if we treated chronically every day, we still saw a big increase in the CFOS expression in these POMC neurons after cytosine treatment. So that was a pretty good idea that despite the fact that we have a lot of different nicotinic receptors in a lot of different neuronal cell types, when you treat peripherally, you sort of get a vector sum of all of the convergence of those nicotinic receptor activities on the activity of particular neural subtypes, and in this case, the POMC neurons. However, that was, again, um, a, a whole animal experiment, and what we really wanted to know is, are there nicotinic receptors directly on those POMC neurons that can cause them to fire? And so here um, with our collab collaborator, Xiaobing Gao, we made slices through the ventral hypothalamus, and we put either nicotine or cytosine on those slices, and we measured. Um, and in this case, the uh, POMC neurons were green because we used mice in which the uh, POMC promoter drove the green fluorescent protein, GFP. So if you record from green neurons, you see that nicotine causes them to fire. Cytosine does too. It's not as obvious here, but you can see there's a dose-dependent increase in the firing rate of these neurons, and it washes out and we can block it with the antagonist mecamelamine. So this suggested that on those neurons directly, there were nicotinic receptors that caused them to fire. And so what that gave us was the possibility that nicotinic receptors could be acting through these neurons, but it didn't guarantee that that was the mechanism that was essential for nicotine's effects on appetite. So first what we did was to take knockout mice that, again, were these constitutive knockout mice, lacked POMC throughout development, and we asked, can cytosine still cause a decrease in food intake if we get rid of the POMC protein. And what you can see is in normal mice, you still have this decrease in food intake with cytosine, but if we knocked out POMC, that was greatly blunted. Now, these mice are really not normal mice. They are obese, they're diabetic, they have a lot of other things wrong with them, so we we're not hugely satisfied with this experiment. Again, like the behavior, we want to get at it from every different direction. And so what we did was to say, here in this circuit, the POMC neurons signal up to the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus is the next part of the circuit through these MC4 receptors in order to say, here, you're sated. This is the satiety circuit. So we thought if we could knock out their receptor, the MC4 receptor, and get the same effect, then we'd be more confident that this activity, this particular circuit, was essential for nicotine's effect on food intake. So we packaged a small hairpin RNA, targeting actually three different small hairpin RNAs, targeting the MC4 receptor. We tagged them with GFP. We put it into the paraventricular nucleus. You can see we get pretty good knockdown. And we then tested, again, the ability of cytosine to decrease food intake. If we simply delivered a, a either scrambled a hairpin or GFP, we still got the decrease in food intake by cytosine. And if we knocked down the MC4 receptor, we got a significantly blunted uh, food intake response. So this suggests that we actually now, again, we have a circuit. So the problem was that we weren't convinced there was actually any of this beta-4 subunit containing nicotinic receptor in these neurons. 
It had never been reported. It was not something that we considered as conventional wisdom. I told you this isn't highly expressed in the sympathetic ganglia. It's also in a very important brain area called the medial habenula, which has been implicated as an accessory reward system, but not so much in the hypothalamus. So what we did was we took those GFP, the POMC GFP mice where the POMC neurons are green. We used laser capture microscopy to actually isolate those green neurons, to isolate the RNA from those neurons, and then we did uh, RT-PCR to see if in those POMC neurons we could actually find the beta-4 transcript. And sure enough, here's a control showing that these, these neurons do have the POMC uh, transcript. They have the beta-4 transcript, and if we do this in beta-4 knockout mice, that beta-4 band goes away, so it is selective. And it does suggest that, yeah, turns out there is beta-4 RNA in these POMC neurons. Who knew? So I was a little surprised. I had, I had not been expecting that. But it did now guide us to the next step, which is if this is the receptor subtype that's important for feeding, we should be able to knock it down, and we should be able to blunt that effect of cytosine or nicotine on food intake. So that's what we did. And as a control, we knocked down the beta-2 subunit, which had been implicated in the addiction effects of, of nicotine. And we did both of these in the ventral hypothalamus, uh, the site of those POMC cell bodies. And you can see that with these small hairpin RNAs, we can either knock down the beta-2 subunit or the beta-4 subunit. We can actually see a difference in nicotine binding when we knock down the beta-2 subunit, which is consistent with its importance as the high affinity binding site. And we look, when we look at the ability of cytosine to decrease food intake, normal mice, we still have that decrease in food intake very acutely. This is um, only uh, two hours after the injection of cytosine. Beta-2 knockdown in the ventral hypothalamus, nothing. I was a little surprised. And yet, if we knock down the beta-4 subunit, it's completely gone. So really, this is nice confirmation of the pharmacology. It's good confirmation of what we saw with the molecular biology. It gives us both a location in the brain, a circuit, as well as a particular molecule that's important for this behavior. So here's the circuit that we're looking at. It's a cartoon. We think that normally these uh, neurons, the POMC neurons in the ventral hypothalamus, do contain alpha-3, potentially. That's the usual, sub, uh, the, the usual partner subunit of beta-4. We don't know for sure if it's expressed here. That's where we're going next. But at least beta-4 containing receptors on their cell bodies, it causes these neurons to respond to acetylcholine. Where is the acetylcholine coming from? Another area that we're very interested in pursuing. Oops, sorry. And in this circuit, although actually another laboratory at the same time, Tony Vandenpol's laboratory said, showed that in isolated neurons, you can get neurons either that have POMC or NPY to fire in response to nicotine. When we take the whole animal, this effect on the POMC neuron predominates, and it doesn't desensitize. And I think that may be why. It is possible that the other subtype that's on the NPY neurons is more susceptible to desensitization. And Tony's lab did show that there was a, a, more, a greater likelihood for that response not to persist. And so then when you stimulate with nicotine, or in our case in the mouse, cytosine, what you get is stimulation of these POMC neurons. They signal up to the paraventricular nucleus. They activate the MC4 uh, uh, receptors, and that is actually the beginning of the pathway that signals satiety. So now again, back to our scheme. We know that these receptors contain the beta-4 subunit. We don't for sure know their alpha partner. We know that there's a brain area, the arcuate nucleus, in particular the POMC neurons where this happens. And once again, we have the link between a particular nicotinic subunit, its role in a particular set of cells, and then this behavioral effect on food intake. So in the last few minutes that I have, I'm going to cover one last behavior that's important for why people report that they smoke. And that is, in particular, that um, people report that they smoke to uh, treat their symptoms of depression and anxiety. And even my own dad, um, who smoked for years and has finally quit, um, said that one time he effectively quit smoking and he was so depressed that he forced himself, perhaps a little bit of justification, to go back to smoking in order not to feel so depressed. And he's not alone. In fact, there are drugs that treat depression that are used for smoking cessation that are effective in a number of people. Um, and so we're interested in how does this reflect the role of nicotinic receptors, in particular circuits in the brain, that are important for mood and for affect. So we know that people who are depressed are more likely to smoke, whereas about 25% of the general population, and actually it's gone down to more like 20 to 
uh, whereas 22% uh, of the general population smoke, about 40 to 60% of patients with major depressive disorder smoke, much higher, at least double. And we know that um, nicotine itself, when just administered on its own, can have effects on mood. However, it is quite paradoxical because depending on how you administer the nicotine, you can either increase or decrease symptoms of depression. So for example, Paul Newhouse back in the 80s showed that if he gave intravenous nicotine to um, uh, subjects, that they actually reported greatly increased anxiety and some depression symptoms. And yet, Salen Pascual and his colleagues who are in Mexico have done a successful clinical trial where they put nicotine patch on non-smokers who are depressed and they can get a significant antidepressant effect of patch. So how can these two things coexist? Well, one thing is that if you know something about the physical properties of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, you can have a hint of how this could happen. One is that IV nicotine gets into the brain quickly, it's cleared quickly, it's fast, and it would tend to activate receptors. Whereas patch, which delivers a much lower level of nicotine to the brain, it keeps it steady for a long period of time, is more likely to actually desensitize or turn off the nicotine receptors in the brain. So our original hypothesis based on these data was that perhaps it's actually turning off the receptors that's essential for regulating symptoms of mood. Maybe the patch is antidepressant not because it's activating nicotine receptors, but because it's desensitizing them. And we're lucky in that, um, well, and then so then the further corollary of that is that smokers actually are likely to be going through cycles in which they're activating the receptors and desensitizing them throughout the day and particularly resensitizing them overnight when they sleep and they're abstinent. And that probably explains why smokers report that they smoke to treat their depressive symptoms. First of all, they're probably creating some of their depressions, depressive symptoms when they activate the receptors and then solving that by profoundly desensitizing the receptors over large portions of the day. So uh, that is also uh, supported by human data. When you give a palm pilot to uh, people who are smoking actively and you ask them to enter their anxiety and depression symptoms, um, Parrot and colleagues showed that they would say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm smoking to relieve my depression symptoms, but then if you give them the palm pilot again after they quit and they're completely through with withdrawal, overall the number of symptoms that they report are lower after they quit than while they're actively smoking. So it's probably true that um, smokers are, are creating some of the symptoms that they're curing. But we had a way to test this because we have a pharmacological agent, mecamilamine, excuse me, that in the mouse is able to block the pore of pretty much all of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So we asked simply, can we use this mecamilamine uh, to change symptoms of uh, actually as an antidepressant-like drug in, in mouse models of antidepressant efficacy. And I'm very careful to call these mouse models of antidepressant efficacy because in general they're validated by using the pharmacological agents that humans use to treat depression. They change behavior in these mouse models in a predictable way, but we can't really tell for sure if a mouse is depressed, obviously. Um, they, they really don't um, very often go see mouse psychiatrists. So what we saw was that in one of these models, and I'm showing you one of many tests that we've done, uh, we've done a, a lot of them, um, and this test is the force swim test where the more a mouse swims in a, in a beaker that it can't get out of, the um, more uh, we call it, well, all right, let me back up. These are tests where we figure we're, fig we're, we're measuring motivation, and this is a core symptom in some cases of, of depression where if an animal is more motivated to escape, it will move more, and if it gives up and it doesn't move and just makes the movements that it, it needs to to stay afloat, then that is a measure of sort of giving up, of less motivation, of a, a behavioral assay of, of um, a motivational symptom, uh, syndrome. So the more immobile that an animal is, the less antidepressant efficacy there is, and the more that an antidepressant works, the less immobile they'll be. So the more, uh, more seconds here, more depression-like, less seconds here, more antidepressant-like. And what we saw was that mecamelamine could actually increase the movement of the animals, decrease its immobility, and it asked, acted very much in this test like things like Prozac or other antidepressants that are used by human. So this is our first hint that mecamelamine could act similarly to classical antidepressants. And we've now done this with tests uh, that have more validity for human depression, so tests like um, learned helplessness, like 
uh, novelty suppressed feeding, which is sensitive to um, chronic administration of nicotinic or, or of any antidepressant. And our question was, is this something that we can uh, identify as, a, as a, an effect of nicotinic receptors in a particular brain area? And so what we first did was to see whether this effect was still there when we got rid of one of the nicotinic receptor subtypes. And in fact, we did the alpha-7 subtype and the beta-2 sub subtype, and I'm showing you this here. You've seen these before. Here's the binding of nicotinic, nicotinic receptors in the presence or absence of the beta-2 subunit. And what you can see here, again, is that um, Mecamelamine decreases immobility, is antidepressant-like in normal mice, but it ab absolutely is not effective in mice lacking the beta-2 subunit. What you can also see is that at baseline, there is a decrease in immobility of these mice, and we don't see this as a general change in locomotion. So it does seem that at least in this assay, there's some kind of baseline effect that looks more like they've had an antidepressant on board. And I'm reluctant to go too far on this, but this is something that we have seen consistently. And it suggests that it's blocking this receptor that is occluded in this test and that's important for the antidepressant properties of mecamilamine. So it turns out that, in fact, in humans, and particularly Tony George and uh, a company Targacept, they were um, able to small, perform small trials using um, mecamilamine, which had been approved for use in humans uh, for, um, uh, for hypertension. And in these small trials, there was some indication that it was effective. Unfortunately, this drug was then tried in very large trials recently by AstraZeneca, and it does not seem to be extremely effective in, in humans at this point. So perhaps there'll be further tri uh, trials in the future, but there was some indication that there could be translation of this mouse uh, data to human. And that, I think that's an open story. So the question is, where in the brain is this happening? And we once again turned to CFOS, and we again asked using two different drugs, cytosine, in this case, and mecamilamine, where cytosine should be blocking the beta-2 subunit-containing receptors, and mecamilamine is definitely blocking all the nicotinic receptors. Where do we see a decrease now in CFOS expression after treatment? And the place where we saw a consistent decrease was the basal lateral nucleus of the amygdala. That's kind of important because the amygdala is a, is a part of the brain that is essential for fear-based behaviors, for emotionality, and is a place that has been, it's a brain area that is consistently shown as being hyperactive in patients with major depressive disorder. So the idea that nicotine could be blocking activity here of nicotinic receptors that are transducing a signal of acetylcholine that might increase during stress or during um, conditions that lead to depression was very attractive. So what we did was to do two experiments. Here I'm showing you mecamilamine, and I'm um, not going to show you the knockdown studies, but they looked exactly the same. We did local infusion, in this case of the blocker, or of a small hairpin RNA targeting the beta-2 subunit, and then we once again looked for immobility in either uh, the tail suspension test or the force swim test. And what we saw was that locally infused into the basolateral amygdala, mecamilamine was antidepressant-like, just as if it was given uh, peripherally. So it was enough to put this locally into the basolateral amygdala or to knock down the beta-2 subunit only in this nucleus to see an antidepressant-like effect. And we did want to see if there was any relevance to humans. And so we collaborated with um, uh, Zubin Baglagar, who's a, a colleague who was at Yale, um, to ask the question, could we see any evidence of this in human subjects? Now, let me tell you a little bit about what our, our thinking is in terms of the circuit. So this is based a lot on uh, Meyer and Seligman. Uh, Meyer is, uh, works at the uh, University of Colorado. And his idea is that evolutionarily, we've evolved the amygdala in order to protect us from threats in the environment. And in a mouse, what that d means is that when you get a threat, you uh, activate your amygdala, you withdraw behavior, and you freeze. So the equivalent in a human is that if you're in a threatening situation, you would withdraw behavior, you wouldn't go out and forage for food, you would withdraw to a safe place, you would stay safe. And that should be very evol evolutionarily favorable. As we evolved, we were very lucky. We got this really huge prefrontal cortex. It distinguishes us from uh, all of the other species, including the higher primates. And that cortical area sends a massive projection, excitatory projection, to a part of the amygdala called the intercalated nucleus, which is GABAergic. It shuts down the activity of the amygdala. So when you know that there is a threat, 
you can actually activate your prefrontal cortex. It will send a projection down here to the amygdala and shut it down. What does that mean? That means if you can see a threat in the environment, and it's actually not that dangerous, you can overcome that, uh, that activity of the amygdala, go out and forage for food, you will have an evolutionary advantage, right? So what that means is that if you can change the balance between these two brain areas, whereas the amygdala is hyperactive in uh, patients with, uh, with depression, the prefrontal cortex is hypo less active in patients with depression, that that might actually be antidepressant-like. And so our, our model is that um, normally stress induces acetylcholine release. You stimulate your nicotinic receptors. It would increase the activity of the amygdala, and the balance would be shifted this way. And if you block nicotinic receptors, that you should actually uh, come back this way, and you should restore normal behavior. And this is in line with uh, the work of a psychiatrist, Janowski, who in the 70s said, I think that if you have too much acetylcholine, you're more likely to be depressed. And the way he showed that was that he gave a blocker of the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine to human subjects. And he saw that if you have too much acetylcholine, you report more depression-like symptoms. So with Zubin, what we did was an imaging experiment where we asked, if normal acetylcholine is at a low level and then you put in the tracer, you should have a significant amount of binding to these nicotinic receptors in vivo. But if you have a lot of acetylcholine in your brain, and we validated this by giving uh, physostigmine to human subjects and doing this tracer study, you, complete, you compete with the tracer and you'll have less binding of the tracer. And that's exactly what Zubin saw. He saw that in patients with, um, these are non-smokers so that there's no competition with nicotine, in patients who are acutely depressed, there was less binding of these nicotinic receptors. And to validate that, you can see it's actually not a local effect in the amygdala. It's a broad effect. So it's likely to be something about a state of, uh, of uh, acetylcholine, either synthesis or release. And if we look post-mortem and we measure how many nicotinic receptors they have in the brain, there's no change in the number of receptors. So this decrease in binding is likely to be an increase in occupancy by acetylcholine. So we think there is a reason to believe that these studies in mice are reflected by a, uh, a measurable effect in, in human depressed patients. So now we're last receptor. We're back to our alpha-4, beta-2. We don't really know the alphas again. We know beta-2 is involved. And in this case, instead of activation, we think, it, uh, and again, we have a brain area, the basal lateral amygdala, and instead of activation, we think it's inhibition of these receptors that's important for the antidepressant-like effects uh, of these nicotinic receptors. So that concludes the, the talk. As I mentioned, the problem was trying to get these, uh, this molecular data, anatomical data, and the behavioral data into a coherent picture of how can we map the specific effects of a whole body bathing uh, with this pharmacological agent to what we know has to be a circuit level regulation of function by acetylcholine and nicotinic receptors. And I think the good news is that as a field, the combination of molecular genetics and pharmacology, both in animal models and then in humans, and the two systems going back and forth and speaking to each other, has allowed us to make really good progress in dissecting which nicotinic receptor subtypes are important in which brain areas for these nicotine dependent behaviors. Now our challenge is that existing pharmacological agents used in humans don't target specific nicotinic receptor subtypes. And I told you earlier in the talk, for example, that agents that are somewhat selective in mice, like cytosine and mecamilamine, actually have somewhat different specificity in humans. So we do need to do better targeting of these receptors. So it's going to be essential to validate new drugs on human, human nicotinic receptors. However, there is uh, a hope, and the hope is that if we could get these more highly selective uh, medications and target them to specifically to different subtypes of receptors, we could dissect out, for example, uh, effects of nicotinic drugs that would help motivate smokers who smoke for reasons other than nicotine reinforcement, for example, appetite control or control of affective symptoms. Maybe we can motivate them to quit. Maybe one of the reasons that they're reluctant to stop is because they're afraid that they're going to gain weight or they're afraid that they'll be depressed. And then, of course, the longer-term hope, and one that's um, really um, more speculative, is that these same medications could potentially work in patients who have these disorders, either eating disorders or uh, who struggle with depression, and that these nicotinic agents could add to our arsenal of medications for those disorders in non-smokers as well. So I will stop there. I'd like to thank um, particularly NIDA 
that has been an agency that has been extremely supportive of my work from the very earliest stages, but also NIMH, who has been um, funding the depression work. Um, and we did the initial work on those depression phenotypes through a tobacco center um, teacher that was funded um, by NIDA to Yale. And in terms of my laboratory, Jan Miner was essential not only for uh, the feeding studies, but has also been really integral in all the studies of depression, which were initiated by Barbara Calderon when she was a postdoc and associate research scientist in the lab. The uh, selective expression of beta-2 was largely done by Sarah King. And I, again, want to thank Jing Shen Shen, who uh, began uh, those, uh, the generation of those animals when he was at Yale. And we've had a number of collaborators, particularly on the feeding project, including the laboratory of Tomas Horvath. I mentioned Xiaobing Gao, who's an electrophysiologist. Daniela Gundish, who's a chemist at the University of Hawaii, who has made some new uh, nicotinic compounds. Uda Huxvender, who sent us the Palm C knockout mice. Uh, Mariela Debiazzi, who did some work in some beta-4 knockout mice that she had, and Julie Staley, who um, pioneered the use of the human nicotinic imaging uh, ligands. And I will stop there with a picture of my lab, as it was actually a little while ago. But thank you very much for your attention. I went over a little bit, so I understand if you all have to go. So uh, we have time for questions uh, before the reception. Hey, could Jonathan. You, hi. So could you comment whether at the dose that you use for cytosine, whether it produces conditioned taste aversion? Right. Uh, not by any means at the lowest doses. So at 100 um, micrograms per, so the, the lowest dose that we used is 0.1 milligram per kilogram. And in fact, we don't see much. <laughs> that was a warning to stand back. We don't see much effect on any behaviors, including, for example, um, effects on place preference. And as far as I know, there is not a, a, an effect on conditioned taste aversion, although um, I'm sure that if you went up higher, for example, to the three kil milligram per kilogram, you would have a profound taste aversion. And at one milligram, wh where's one the One milligram dose? per kilogram, I don't, I, I would guess that there might be, but I have not done that myself, so I don't know the answer to that. And, could, and in human studies mm -hmm. or with cytosine, you actually see weight gain. Could you That is absolutely that? true, and not just with cytosine, but also with varenicline. So varenicline is a partial agonist of uh, the beta-2 subunit. And in, um, in mice, we see weight loss, or we see, avoid, or we see a decrease in food intake with varenicline, and you see weight gain in humans. So again, uh, when we do the oocyte studies, the specificity of these agents for beta-4-containing subunits clearly differs between mouse and human, which is too bad because it would be really nice to have some agents that were already approved for use in humans that we could use um, for these purposes, but we do not. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to pull it back to the arcuate. In the POMC cart neurons that uh, have the beta-4, does beta-4 identify a subset of POMC cart neurons or all, all POMC right. cart neurons? We don't have the answer to that, and I think that's a great question. We, we took all of the POMC neurons we could find, and we put them in a test tube, and we hoped to get enough RNA to do the uh, RT-PCR. So uh, the way to do that is obviously by um, in situ hybridization. We simply haven't done it yet. It's on the list. Uh, I would guess that it identifies a subset, and here's why. When uh, there are a few, two papers at least that I know of that have looked at markers of cholinergic synthesis in POMC neurons, and so that's choline acetyl transferase. And there is choline acetyl transferase in a subset of the POMC neurons, not all of them. So there's probably some diversity in whether or not they are actually potentially cholinergic themselves, and that not all of them look the same. So I'll keep you posted. So I was going to ask the other question about which you just started to answer, yeah. which was, what are the cholinergic inputs to mm. the... Uh, we arcuate? don't know. So as I said, there's this one um, suggestion that the POMC neurons themselves could be cholinergic, and so it could be an auto uh, receptor. Uh, I think that's definitely a possibility and one that we're exploring. Uh, the other possibility is that brainstem nuclei, like the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus or the um, pedunculo pontine tegmental nucleus, actually project toward the um, POMC neurons, and that's one that I'd be pretty excited about. So what we're doing now is initiating studies tracing the cholinergic inputs using um, some crelox p technology in viral vectors where we would only be labeling cholinergic neurons. We'll see what happens. Thank you. Sure. 
So you probably know that a, a group that smokes even more than teenage girls or depressed patients is schizophrenic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and do you have any speculation as to the Yeah, so why? I'm going to refer to studies by my colleague Tony George, who's done some really beautiful work on, um, on, on visual attention. So the speculation for um, schizophrenic subjects, and, and this was really work that began with the pioneering studies by uh, Pat Goldman or Peach, suggesting that if you have um, a, a neuron that's working optimally and you stimulate it, um, for example, in the prefrontal cortex with uh, D1 agonists, if that neuron's working optimally, it's going to get worse when you stimulate it. And if it's not working optimally, as in a schizophrenic, if you increase the dopaminergic input, you will get optimal function. So Tony's idea is that in, in non-schizophrenic, we actually have fairly good cholinergic regulation, particularly of prefrontal cortex, and that perhaps in schizophrenics, that uh, function is impaired, and so that they're smoking to get back to normal function. So what he did was to take schizophrenic subjects and non-schizophrenic subjects, ask them to do a spatial attention task, as you might expect. Uh, these were smokers, sorry. They were actively smoking. As you might expect, even smoking, the schizophrenic subjects did not do as well as the non-schizophrenic subjects. But then, here's the cool part, he asked everybody to quit. And what he saw, which is very surprising, is that the non-schizophrenic subjects, once they quit smoking and went through withdrawal, got better at the spatial attention task, whereas the schizophrenics got worse. So the idea that he had is that if you are medicating a deficit in your ability to tune your prefrontal cortical neurons so that you correctly match environmental stimuli to um, cognitive uh, processes in prefrontal cortex, then the stimulation that you get from the nicotine and tobacco actually is improving your function. It's improving the tuning so that you can either tune out inessential sensory information or actually focus on relevant spatial information. If you don't have that deficit, actually you get worse when you stimulate these circuits. And so um, the idea is that it is, again, self-medication and that um, schizophrenic individuals are uh, tuning their neurons more, uh, more uh, effectively when nicotine is on board. And that's work that is also um, in line with Sherry Leonard and Bob Friedman's work at the University of Colorado, where they suggest that um, overall the nicotinic system is not functionally op functioning optimally in patients with schizophrenia, so they're actually stimulating those nicotinic receptors more profoundly when they smoke. Not probably related to the, the things that I talked about here, but again, something that's dissectable with particular tools that ask is it in prefrontal cortical principal neurons? Is it in the thalamocortical or corticothalamic, corticothalamic uh, arms of those loops? Which nicotinic receptors? There's indications that alpha-7 is very critical for those kinds of attentional functions. Uh, when during development is this important? And those kinds of questions are at, under active uh, investigation by people like, um, for example, Heidi Mansfelder, uh, Evelyn Lamb, the University of Toronto, uh, and others. Thank you very much for your attention.